Yo, what's up, family? It's Res the Ruler. Um, today's Leaders Are Readers Challenge is uh, brought to you by What's Up African Apparel and Born Royalty uh, Success and Achievement Club. Now, um, last couple entries that I made, I was reading from uh, a book called The Key to Living the Law of Attraction. I'm going to take a little break from that book today and give y'all some history um, on this country that we currently occupy. Um, this book right here, this doozy right here, is called Settlers, The Mythology of the White Proletariat from Mayflower to Modern. Now, um, the word proletariat, a lot of us probably aren't familiar with. It's not one that's used uh, commonly in our, uh, in our you know, everyday language. But um, from what I understand, uh, I mean, it's basically proletariat is the working class. Proletariat or proletarians um, are the are the working class. And uh, furthermore, what's significant about that word is that a proletarian, the only value that they bring is their ability to work. That's the only value that like only perceived value that a that a member of a of the proletariat has okay so um, once again let me read that to y'all settlers the mythology of the white proletariat from mayflower to modern <clears throat> okay um now i'm going to jump into chapter one uh and it's called the heart of whiteness uh the land is the basis of nationhood now, the key to understanding America, with a K, is to see that it was a chain of European settler colonies that expanded into a settler empire. To go back and understand the lives and the consciousness of the early English settlers is to see the embryo of today's American empire. This is the larger picture that allows us to finally relate the class conflicts of settler Euro-Americans to the world struggle. The mythology of the white masses holds that those early settlers were the poor of England, convicts and workers who came to North America in search of freedom or a better way of life. Factually, that's all nonsense. Uh, the celebrated pilgrims of Plymouth Rock, for example, didn't even come from England, although they were English. Uh, they had years before immigrated as a religious colony to Holland, where they had lived in peace for over a decade. But in Holland, these predominantly middle-class people had to work as hired labor for others. This was too hard for them, so they came to North America in search of less work and more money. At first, according to the rules of the faith, they farmed the land in common and shared equally. Soon their greed led them into fighting with, other, with each other, slacking off at assigned tasks, etc. until the colony's leaders had to give in to the settlers' desires and divide up the stolen land, um, quote, unquote, giving to every family a parcel of land. Um, this is typical of the English invasion forces. A study of roughly 10,000 settlers who left Bristol from 1654 to 1685 shows that less than 15 percent were proletarian. Most were youth from the lower middle classes, gentlemen and professionals, 1%, yeomen, Y-E-O-M-E-N, yeomen and husbandmen, 48%, artisans and tradesmen, 29%. The typical age was 22 to 24 years old. In other words, the sons and daughters of the middle class with experience at agriculture and craft skills were the ones who thought they had a practical chance in America. What made North America so desirable to these people? Land. Euro-American liberals and radicals have rarely dealt with the land question. We can say that they don't have to deal with it since their people already have all the land. What lured Europeans to leave their homes and cross the Atlantic was the chance to share in conquering Indian land. At that time, there was a crisis in England over land over ownership and tenancy due to the rise of capitalism. One scholar of the early invasion comments on this. The land hunger was rife among all classes. 
wealthy clothiers, drapers, and merchants who had done well and wished to set themselves up in land were avidly watching the market, ready to pay almost any price for what was offered. Even prosperous yeomen often could not get the land they desired for their younger sons. It is commonplace to say that land was the greatest inducement in the new world had to, the greatest inducement that the new world had to offer. But it is difficult to overestimate its psychological importance to people in whose minds land had always been identified with security, success, and the good things of life. And the, it was these younger sons, despairing of owning land in their own country, who were willing to gamble on the colonies. The Brutal Enclosure Acts and the ending of many hereditary tenancies acted as a further push in the same direction. These were the principal reasons given on the immigration list of 1773 to 76 for settling in America, so that participating in the settler invasion of North America was a relatively easy way out of the desperate class struggle in England for those seeking a privileged life. Wow. So then, too, many English farmers and artisans couldn't face the prospect of being forced down into a position of wage labor. Traditionally, hired laborers were considered so low in English society that they ranked far below mere failures and were considered degraded outcasts. Many English, including the quote-unquote levelers, the anti-capitalist revolutionary outbreak of the 17th century, thought that wage laborers should lose their civil rights and English citizenship. Wow. Public opinion was so strong on this that the early English textile factories were filled with Irish and Welsh immigrants, children from the poor houses and single women. So jumping the ocean in search of land was not some mundane career decision of comparing dollars and cents to these Englishmen. It was a desperate venture for continued status and self-respect. See that? status and self-respect. Uh, the various colonies competed with each other in offering inducements to new settlers. In the South, the head right system gave each new settler 50 acres for transporting themselves from England. Eventually, Pennsylvania and the Carolinas offered even more land per settler as a lure. And land was dirt cheap for Europeans. In Virginia, 10 shillings bought a tract of 100 acres. In Pennsylvania, the best land sold per acre at what a carpenter would earn in a day. When new communities of invaders were started on the edges of conquered areas, the settlers simply divided up the land. For example, when Wallington, Connecticut was founded in 1670, each settler got between 238 and 476 acres. This amount was not unusual since colonial America was an orgy of land grabbing. In fact, much of the land at first wasn't even purchased or rented. It was simply taken over and settled. As much as two-thirds of the tilled land in Pennsylvania during the 1700s was occupied by white squatters protected by settler solidarity. See that? Solidarity. They were protected by each other. So central was the position of, the, of land in the personal plans of the English settlers that throughout the colonial period there was a shortage of skilled labor. Wow. Richard Morris's study of labor in colonial America concluded, in the, main, in the main, the ultimate economic objective of colonial workmen was security through agriculture rather than industry. As soon as a workman had accumulated a small amount of money he could, and in many cases did take up a tract of land and settle on it as a farmer. You see that? Where land was not available, settlers refused to come. Period. This is why, in the, this is why the British West Indies, with their favorable climate, were less attractive to these settlers than wintry New England. As early as 1655, a member of the Barbados Assembly complained, noting that the limited space of that island had already been divided up. Now we, now we can get a few English servants having no lands to give them at the end of their time, which formerly was their main allurement. And British servants, their terms up, would leave the Indies by the thousands for America. 
It was this alone that drew so many Europeans to colonial North America, the dream in the settler mind of each man becoming a petty lord of his own land. Thus, the tradition of individualism and egalitarianism in America was rooted in the poisoned concept of equal privileges for a new nation of European conquerors. That's all I'm going to give y'all. This is the book right here, Settlers, the Mythology of the White Proletariat from Mayflower to Modern. Once again, a proletariat is a, um, is a working class member of a capitalist society whose uh, only perceived value is their ability to work. Uh, once again, this is Brez the Ruler. I'm checking out, y'all. Leaders are readers challenge. Hashtag leaders are readers. Follow our page on Facebook, Leaders Are Readers Challenge. Um, hey, man, we doing this. This is live. One love, one God, one people. Peace, power.